for me, it's it's never been about paying the bills um, first, you know. Of course, I'd love to pay my bills. <laughs> um, I do pay my bills. <laughs> I take pride on, do, you know, um, doing that. But yeah, if I were just trying to pay the bills, you'd see me playing for, you know, Katy Perry or, you know, Lady some G pop artist. Lady, Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga or yeah. something. Um, I mean, I would like to do that at some point to, you know, experience that um, and to have that to have that experience, you know. Um, I mean, I played for pop artists before, but on a scale like that, that would be that'd be fun. But I I, I couldn't see myself doing that like ex for an extended period of time. But regardless, I'm just saying that's never been my intent. And if you listen to animals, it's like you know we're pretty we're pretty true to ourselves and pretty true to you know the music comes first today our guest is minel symbols artist matt garska matt is best known as the drummer for the progressive metal trio animals as leaders with animals as leaders matt has firmly established himself as one of the greats his drumming with the band has stunned listeners through its fierce combination of muscle and highly technical inventiveness matt seemingly came from out of nowhere showed up in Animals as Leaders, and quickly captured the hearts of drummers worldwide. In a band that was known for its guitar playing, Matt forced his bandmates Tosin and Javier to step up even harder by weaving a tapestry of drumming night after night on tour that was just as much of a highlight as his bandmates' guitar heroics. Matt has achieved his incredible level of proficiency on this instrument through a work ethic that, while not quite superhuman, is super rare. Putting in eight to 10 hours a day of practice while growing up was normal for Matt. That discipline helped him get the most out of his next step, which was an education at the Berklee School of Music in Boston, Massachusetts. That experience was a four year deep dive musical immersion for Matt, where he owned his already considerable skills to a razor sharp edge. Not too long after graduating from Berkeley, Matt joined Animals as Leaders and the word quickly spread about this unbelievable drummer and the force of nature that he projected from behind the drum set. I met Matt not too long after his having joined Animals as Leaders. Minel cymbal artist J.P. Bouvet called me up one day and asked me if I knew the band, which I did because the drum chair had just been vacated by a Minel cymbal artist. He then asked if I was interested in their new drummer, as their new drummer was interested in Minel. I hadn't heard Matt play yet, but I knew that if he was in Animals as Leaders, then he had to be pretty good. So J.P. connected us and the rest is history. Matt has been an essential part of the Minel family since having started playing our cymbals. He's helped create two incredibly popular cymbals with us. First, the artist concept model Matt Garska Fat Stack, and second, the Byzance Vintage Series Equilibrium China. Both cymbals have brought unique voices to our range of cymbals that are as individualistic as is Matt as a person and as a drummer. We recently had Matt in Nashville to film a project called Gem a trio that also involves prodigy keyboardist and composer Eldar Jangarov and the extremely talented bassist Henrik Linder of the band Dirty Loops. The group laid down four tracks for video, tracks that were recorded in late 2017 for a project that hasn't seen the light of day yet, but it will. The first video for a track called Vertigo is out now and can be seen on Minel Symbol's YouTube page. While Matt was in town, we sat him down for a podcast interview. Not surprisingly, Matt had very strongly held beliefs about drumming and music. Beliefs that had been forged through his devotion to his craft, and his willingness to put in the time and discipline that most mortals cannot. So without further ado, here's Matt Garska. I'd like to welcome everybody in to the Minel Radio Podcast, and today we have my good friend and Minel Symbols artist, Matt Garska. Matt, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So we are at a super secret, undisclosed location in Nashville, Tennessee, at a studio where we just wrapped up a video session yesterday for a project called GEM. You spell that G-E-M. It includes Matt and also his compatriots Eldar Jangarov, a world-class prodigy piano player, and Henrik Linder, who is the bass phenomenon of the Swedish band Dirty Loops. These guys came together and played four tracks off of an album that Matt and Eldar recorded later last year in 2017 that will see the light of day soon and they blew us all away with some high velocity shit today i've got a lot of random questions to throw at you matt and okay. uh in no uncertain order i'm just gonna fire it out there all right so 
Last night, after we got done with this entire video session, we went to Martin's Barbecue here in Nashville, and the conversation was about a lot of things, but at one point it was super interesting. It was about the age-old um, hypothetical scenario of being stranded on a desert island and what albums would you choose. And it was super interesting listening to these three guys tell us their choices. So just for those of us that were not at dinner last night, which are many, <laughs> can you please share what three of those albums were? I think that's what we limited it to, right? Three? Uh, probably the three most influential would be, um, I mean, Chick Chickoria is definitely, you know, one of the most influential uh, musicians to me. And he's always got incredible musicians or drummers steve gad uh dave weckel gary novak vinnie caliuta um so i don't know I'd, I'd probably have to first go with uh the live paint the world um live in warsaw um and it was originally a dvd actually that they released but somehow i got the audio someone ripped the audio and this is like when i was like 14, 15, I got this, and, um, that's, Gary Novak's playing there is, is, that, that's the best drum solo on tum Tumba Island I've ever heard in my life, still to this day. Um, so that's probably the number one. What did that album do for your, your musicianship? Looking back on having listened to it countless times, if you could say, this is what I really got from that, what would it be? I mean, with something to that degree it's not just one dimensional sure. you know it 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 transcends and works across all dimensions which is why it keeps giving back to you why you can keep listening back to it and and keep digging up more you know gems and little you know um treats like uh, but one of the main things it's it's done for me is it's always pushed me to the to the next level. Like, had me, it's it's set a really high goal. Just impeccable timing, chops, patterns, interplay um, with Chick. You know, Gary's interplay with Chick and well, the whole band, um, and uh, the discipline he has too. You know. Um, yeah, just a, a fluidity that, you know, it straddles a nice line between, like, too fluid, kind of like, like Dave Weckl's, like, some uh, ultra fluid, you know, but not powerful. Then you got, like, someone like Dennis Chambers, really powerful, Billy Cobham, really powerful, but not as fluid in the same way. You know, it's not, like, finessed, you know, it's a muscled a bit. So, like, I think Gary, he he gets that perfectly where it's, like... It's that perfect combo, and I mean, if you listen to it, you'll you'll hear an incredible amount of detail and perfection. What's another? Hmm. Probably "Secrets" by Alan Holdsworth um, with Vinnie Caliuta. Uh, that's pretty expressive, pretty colorful playing. Um, Yeah, what else? I don't know. That that's hard, man. At this point, I would, I would, you know, be like, okay, I need a Mashuka album on this desert island. I need, you know, some Latin album. Probably Daphne's Prieto about the monks. I would need just a rock album, which would that for me. We were talking about this last night. Would be a uh, um, DLR band, uh, and that's Ray Luzier, and I feel like that's the epitome of rock drumming. Like he summed it up there in that entire album performance. And so drums going, sound great too. Yeah. Going back to the Secrets record, because uh, there was a, a fellow minor artist who turned me onto that album, and um, you said very colorful. So I guess to back up Holdsworth, you've got to be colorful. Yeah, and so that's something you got from that was coloring within your drumming yeah um can you tell everybody yeah. what coloring means in drumming so i uh, so it's not just kind of like uh 
textural as in like you know coloring with symbols and coloring with you know press rolls and um things like that it's you know it's kind of like you know a symbol is one color a, a press roll is another color uh you know um toms are another color but when you mix these colors you get another color so that's a new color so for me that means putting different colors together that people usually don't put together mm. people put together the you know duck -a -duck -a -duck -a -duck -a. they put that together all the time which is snare and toms like we see that color all the time you know um sn snare meets cymbal snare meets or, or uh cymbal meets bass drum but we don't often hear like a crash out in the open you know or like a like some on there he does some like rolls and like goes from the the snare to the the hi-hat it's like super that, uncommon yeah just and expressive too like extremely detailed and, and finite too so it's like you know calculated it's like it, it's it's very intentful it's like the it's meant to be this particular color like the you know as we know you you mix a certain amount of you know one color with a certain amount of another like if you change the ratios of one another to each other that also changed the the color you know what i'm saying i totally get it though because i was telling you this yesterday when we were recording so a lot of people play a stack in sort of one way mm -hmm. but i was telling you that i was hearing you playing your stack in ways that i have not heard a stack being played before you took it and made it uh shimmer where most people make it chop mm -hmm. and um and it was at very specific times that you did it. It was at the right moments. Yeah. And so I guess that could be an example, maybe, of what you're talking about, thinking outside the box of the normal uses of these colors, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I definitely I try to use the stack in that way. Like It, it, it cre it's, creates a new sound when you couple the stack with a snare. You know, it's, right. It sounds different than just a snare or just a stack. Or rather, it feels different. It feels like a new sound source, you know. So uh, last little bit about this question, before, and then we'll move on. But mm -hmm. it's interesting, you mentioned Ray Lazier with the DLR band. Yeah. So obviously you have a very heavy component to your playing, so anybody who thought about it for more than a minute would know, yeah, of course, Matt's listened to plenty of rock before. But yeah. people don't automatically assume you with more straight-ahead rock. They don't, excuse me, not assume, they don't affiliate you with that kind of a thing. Right. So, um, Luzier, obviously a world-class player. What, what did you get from listening to him and his approach to playing that kind of stuff? How has that been, uh, something you've, what is it you've admired about it? That's, uh, that's kind of more the, you know, the typical colors that you see, like s snare with cymbal, um, you know, snare, uh, kick with cymbal type of playing, which is like, it's got a it's got a thing too. It's got a utility. It's very useful um, to give like that hard hitting feel. You know, when you're going doing a like the Vinny snare roll off of a hi hat, you know, and like fluttery. It's like that's that's completely different. That's like I'm painting finessing. You know, whereas like this is just like this is what it is and it's like simple but everything's like everything is powerful and really intentful as well so killer feel and killer attitude yeah man the attitude is is through the roof on that record for me so, uh, last question about album stuff this is a new question we can edit this out if you're like uh, I don't know man mm -hmm. but I I'm curious about this. So for drummers that have gone over the hump of the beginner stage and they're progressing nicely through the novice stage, they're very interested in the progressive side of music. They admire players like you. They admire um, guys like uh, Billy Reimer or Matt Halpern or whomever. The guys that... Gavin Harrison. Right, Gavin. Guys like that. Guys that think a little more outside the box. So... Which albums would you recommend for them that can help them hear the drumming vocabulary that they're developing in their practice routines being put into a form that's not too over their heads, you know? 
like you can jump into something that's just so complex, like it takes you years and years to to grasp it. If you're at a stage, God forbid, it takes years and years to to get good. Uh, right. I know. <laughs> we want it all now. But I mean, something that they can understand no, a little bit better now. I I actually am not the per- I'm the wrong person to ask. Okay. I'm not that guy because I I didn't. I'm and I'm realizing this. You know, I'm I'm not the guy to to teach the basic lessons because it's like. I've never gone for just basic, you know, like I, I, I've, I do the basics to create a strong foundation, but my intent was this guy, you know, and I was willing to put in eight hours to 10 hours a day. So, you know, I could spend my time doing things that are so detail oriented and fixate so much on, you know, getting every detail perfect you know, whereas like most people just don't have time for that. So, you know, the types of things that I've really found gratifying, you know, um, if you do those, like I've, that's been a compart, it's been a component of my practice. I've also done the extremely foundational stuff at the same time, you know, but if you just were to, you know, take away the foundational basics and, do that other stuff. I mean, uh, everything's got to be in balance. So sure, that's kind of how you get to an extreme level is by having an extreme amount of time and, and work put in, you know, and an extreme amount of it, like testing. You're basically, I just, I would say to any beginner, like look at yourself as an experiment, you know, and you're trying to um, see what you respond to, uh, what you're playing responds to basically, and trying to be objective with yourself. And, you know, there's gotta be like a monk like attitude at, you know, improvement and, um, like Zen to the practicing. You, you have to be willing to be extremely patient and, um, like, yeah, just chip away at it every day. It's like a, it's a sculpture and you're chipping away every day. You're trying to, you know, make this thing into something that you say that's, that's beautiful. So as far as listening goes, which is also a form of practicing, listening to music and trying to understand, Yeah, you would say that, uh, for the, that type of person that I just asked you about, just go ahead and listen to the deepest shit possible and keep listening to it. And one day you will grasp it. If you keep at it with your Zen like attitude towards yeah. Practice. I mean, I that's what I did. Yeah. I mean, I I, I was hearing things beyond beyond my hearing or, or comprehension. Like I would, you know, fourteen, fifteen years old, I was listening to King Crimson, listening to you know Gary Novak, Steve Gadd, Dave Wuckel, Vinny Caliuta with Chikoria, and you know, um, you know, like Ravi Shankar, Anushka Shankar. You know, my dad would you know, have some weird stuff, um, that was cool, but, you know, you try to understand, but sometimes I, I'll go back to stuff that I didn't understand and, and hear it as I understand it now, and I'm like, oh, wow, and it's not like it's, you know, um, messed me up, you know. Sure, but you hear it differently now because you know a lot more now than you did then. Yeah, but yeah, I think you gotta, you gotta push beyond your, Push your, your listening beyond. Yeah, yeah that's cool. You, you got to try, but it it can also be dangerous too because you can, you know, if you're hearing quintuplets and um, you think that it's sixteenth notes, you know, you could m- potentially mess up your hearing for that thing. You go to listen back, and like you have a real hard time hearing it as quintuplets because you've heard it wrong. Mm. That's that's a thing that you know. Um, if you learn it wrong, so to speak, you know, sure. like learn a riff wrong or like permutate it or something, it, it you got to like relearn it, you know, but I think that's, you know, that's a livable danger. That's part of the journey. Yeah. So uh, one more question that might be a little out of your wheelhouse, but I thought I'd throw it at you. Uh, so I know you really enjoy the educational component of drumming. Mm-hmm. So this is kind of a specific one. Everyone always talks about young drummers and what they need to work on 
in the multitude of hours in a day that younger guys have at their disposal. They have no responsibilities, more or less. They can come home from school and they can just play for five hours, stop, eat dinner, play for two more hours. Um, so they can really put in the time on everything. Mm -hmm. However, if you get on socials and you kind of read forums and things like that, you'll notice there's this contingency of guys who are maybe starting to gather a lot more responsibilities in their lives, uh, things that sort of hold them back from having that abundance of time. But they're still super fans of drumming and they want to progress and they want to get better. Right. There's not as much of a, um, a, a syllabus, so to speak, like a... There's not as much of a time management system for these guys right? for how they can improve. So let's say you've got a guy who only has an hour a day to practice. Maybe he's 28 years old. He just had his first kid. He's got one hour a day where he can actually sit and, and play on the drums. What, Regardless of where he's at in his drumming, he's not a beginner. You know, mm -hmm. This guy's been playing for a while. Yeah. What sorts of core component things do you think a person like that needs to do every day just to make sure he ups his game a little bit more all the time what are the sorts of things he should work on that that's precisely the question that i'm talking about that i feel like i'm the wrong guy to ask because <laughs> i've never done just an hour a day you know? right and even if i do it now and feel like oh you know that's i i think i could do that i think i could do an hour a day now and m maintain what i have it's like it's because of done over 25,000 hours of practice and, sure and I used to I used to not understand how some of these guys that I would talk to like heroes of mine how they like I would talk to them and they're like yeah I don't really practice anymore I'm like what I'm like what, what are you talking about that seems insane you're you're incredible like what how does that work you know it's like almost enraging to me but now I'm starting to see like you know my skill uh solidify you know in a in a new way crystallize in a in a new way um which i'm trying not to you know be like oh i'm good i, I didn't practice for three days and i'm killing still you know i'm trying not to you know let that keep me from wanting to improve um but my my point is basically you know the uh, the hour a day thing I, I can't I don't know that I can help with that you know? that's okay you don't have to keep it foundation I mean what are you trying to do are you trying to play in bars you know if you're trying to play in in bars doing you know top forty covers then sure you know like work on that work on whatever you're gonna be if you only got an hour a day you got to be pretty certain of what your goal is you know if your goal is to become one of the best drummers in the world it's not going to happen you know this not is with a, an hour a day this is exactly the type of answer i was looking for <laughs> i yeah. mean it, tough love but like you know you it doesn't mean that you can't do anything it doesn't mean that you can't find happiness in music and that you know um you can't set a goal be intent on the goal and you know, put your blinders on and be able to accomplish that. Even if it's just pl killing the top 40 songs at a, at a bar gig, you know, or if you want to become a recording musician, that's, that's different. You know, that's works. The recording, you know, sessions are drying up. You're probably going to have to do it on your own, some, your own project, you know, it's not going to happen in an hour and doing an hour a day, you mm -hmm. know? It's like how do I how do I become the Wall you know a Wall Street mogul if I only have an hour a day to <laughs> to dedicate to learning accounting? Right. I feel it's kind of but I like what, ri ridiculous. You uh, know? But I like what you said about you know, if you're going to be a top forty drummer, if that's going to be a side gig for you, something to make a lot of extra money, take an hour and do nothing but work on songs. Yeah, the, the, you know, focus on that. Focus yeah. like take every minute and make it purposeful which is a big yeah. deal i've talked i was talking about this with benny grab and podcast interview we did with him talking about purpose and intent you can really accelerate along those lines if you utilize that sort of thing yeah and again like you said you're not going to be the best drummer in the world but you'll be a lot better than you were if you take that hour and do something with it that is focused solely on your goal 
Yeah. Instead of just sitting down and farting around for five minutes on a beat, and then you've already lost five minutes out of an hour. Yeah. That's a lot. Although that that's important. That's that can be extremely fulfilling. Like, you know, I I can't imagine my you know doing my practice sessions without having that freedom where I allow myself to go and explore and have fun you know it's like you, is, you need that and that's what music is for most people you know it's not you know it's they're not as serious as i am where it's like you you gotta make yourself suffer you gotta do the things that no one else will do but why will no one else do it because it's a pain in the ass man to sit down and make sure your unisons are perfectly unison you know yeah yeah <laughs> Like to down to the like as small as you can feel and and think you know and be like nope that might have not been exactly to the millisecond unison you know yeah well you just mentioned it there's another component of what someone could do for part of their routine it could be so much time dedicated towards exploration and creativity and fun just off the top of their heads yeah that is a, a part of development as well. Yeah, I would I would say to actually give some not to just be like you can't do it and you know um to give some some helpful things. Yeah, I would say it's all about balance. You know, it's all about having the amount of foundational work that you do in balance with the amount of fun that you have. You cool. know, it's at least 50/50. Yeah. You know, meaning 50% given to foundational tech technique coordination like yeah unisons uh time t strict timing like putting on a grid or even just and grooving with that ex exact getting your timing precise and as machine like and quantized as possible mm. like doing that exercise um and then there's you know everything beyond that but that's that's for a beginner it's like you know usually you want to get them developing good time and control and then kind of go towards a more groove like okay now you're getting somewhere between now that you understand 16th strict 16th notes strict triplets or strict swung you know um now blur that line and you know it's not perfectly triplets you know perfect so let's shift a little bit i want to ask you a, a couple of questions about your um current gig animals mm -hmm. as leaders so you straddle two worlds it harder edge stuff metal if you want to call it that with animals as leaders mm -hmm. and jazz fusion with some of these side projects you've been involved with yeah like the album you recorded yesterday, the, excuse me, the album you recorded with Eldar that we did video for yesterday, that's a great example of this sort of jazz fusion, just sonic ex exploration kind of thing. Um, so do you see a time when you might lean more heavily towards the jazz fusion side of things, or does that really just depend, practically speaking, on which genre pays the bills? Um... For me, it's it's never been about paying the bills um, first, you know. Of course, I'd love to pay my bills. <laughs> um, I do pay my bills. <laughs> I take pride on, do, you know, um, doing that. But, uh, yeah, if I were just trying to pay the bills, you'd see me playing for, you know, Katy Perry or, you know, I don't know. Lady some G pop artist lady, lady gaga, gaga or yeah. something um i mean i would like to do that at some point to you know experience that um and to have that to have that experience you know um i mean i played for pop artists before but on a scale like that that would be that'd be fun but i i, I couldn't see myself doing that like ex for an extended period of time but regardless i'm just saying that's never been my intent. And if you listen to animals, it's like, you know, we're pretty, um, we're pretty true to ourselves and pretty true to, you know, the music comes first. You know, it's not about a record deal, not about, you know, 
That's um, a pretty jazz fusion ideal in and of itself. Yeah, well, it's an instrumental group. I yeah. mean, you, you kind of have that more of that freedom. You don't you don't have a singer, um, you know, trying to make songs about you know love and heartbreak and you know. Yeah. Do you think that one day? Um, yes, you I, might I, find I'll, yourself in that. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll. I'll I, I've been a fusion drummer at heart for you know since I was a, since I was a kid. Yeah. Since I was a teenager, so I mean I'm a rock drummer. You know my dad raised me rock, blues, some reggae in there, but then I became a fusion jazz fusion funk Latin head, and I was also then I became a metal head. You know so like I, I've um I've had a lot of fun playing be, having the ability to play all of that in animals like there's there's definitely a lot of styles pulled from in animals you know i, I don't just see it as prog metal you know yeah. i don't think any of us in the band just see it as that either it's our influences are too broad you know when you see the write-ups out there and I, I'm asking genuinely because I don't know. When you see the write-ups out there, do people put you in that box? Or do they understand that there's a lot more to it than that? Like the reviewers? Um, I think people understand. I think they understand. It's a, it's a lot more to it. But it, you know, it helps to have a style that you say something is. Rather than, it just helps to say it's instrumental prog metal right. instead of being like, it's instrumental prog metal with uh, elements of classical, um, some jazz harmony, and, uh, you know, it's rhythmically complex. Yeah, um, you lose people Harmonically that complex, and there's also elements of electronica in there as well. It's like, m most people aren't that unfortunately most people their listening is not that broad you know they need a little box that they could put it into and understand yeah, yeah. so i'm curious we you and i've talked before about animals recording when you record albums there had been a more of a rigid is maybe a negative word and i don't mean for it to be but there was more of a really defined way you did it and then on this last album you guys got outside the box a little bit more and started exploring in terms of the way you recorded it. So I like how you're you're dancing around the fact that Joy of Motion was like quantized <laughs> and Madness of Many was not. <laughs> yeah, there, you said it perfect. Um, so yeah, th that's not taboo for me to talk, to talk about. about like, okay. Yeah, no, I mean, I. Um, well, wait, I got a question. Here's my question. Okay. So, how bound to modern technology? is animals as leaders when it comes to recording albums if someone held a gun to your collective heads and told you to write an album write it not just record it also write it you could use a computer for writing it but uh for the demos but you had to make the album on two inch analog tape and the only extra you got was a click track and could you guys do it and what would that sound like would you enjoy the process um, well, you can track separately on a two-inch analog. Yeah, no, of course you can, but it's yeah. it's kind of a it's you know it's when you when you punch in that kind of a thing you know, you got to have a razor blade and uh, you know to cut tape and then seal it back together. It's a whole yeah so different you're, thing. You're, you're you're saying you want to say we're playing together, right? That's your scenario. Yeah, I yeah, think we yeah. could do that. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean we were like we rehearse the tunes for a tour and it's incredibly tight, you know. Um, I think, you know, we could, we could do it live. We, we actually, um, in live in studio, we, we're, we're coming out with a, a live album soon, actually. Nice. So that should be dope. Do you and think you that's us raw a hundred percent. That's, wow. you know, just, that's just us. Yeah. It would take quite a bit of rehearsal. That's, that's part of the thing too, is like time and time to invest in, you know, perfecting the tunes that that would be the the biggest issue mm. you know um to where we feel like we are as tight as you know we can get things whenever you know tracking individually 
and taking the best takes from each person and being able to be like, oh, this little spot here, okay, we're, we'll take another take, you know, put it in there. Hmm. Uh, last question about animals. So after graduation from Berkeley, you jumped pretty quickly into your current career after you landed the animals gig. Mm -hmm. What sorts of things have you learned on the animals gig that going to school never could have taught you? Nothing. School <laughs> prepared me for everything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, musically speaking, I was as prepared as I could have been. Not, I mean, that was my whole focus at Berkeley was, was being as musically proficient and uh, equipped with the skill set that I needed to play any gig to to do it. Um, so it was like, it was different things that, you know, you, you learn on tour, you know, one's getting along with other people that you're, you're living in very close quarters with. And, you know, everyone's sleep deprived, usually, you know, there's, you know, the food situation is, is not always ideal. Sometimes, you know, people getting hangry. And, uh, I mean, there's also alcohol injected in there usually. Um, that's just tour life. Uh, I mean, yeah, you just gotta try to be a, a good person, you know? Um, but aside from that, you know, there's, there's thing, there's technical things like, you know, knowing your, you know, your interfaces, your, your, um, computer programs, your, your gear, basically, you know, aside from just drum gear, um, which, you know, I, that was a learning curve for me too, even though I, I, I had learned a lot at Berkeley from that as well. It, it you know, it, I wasn't fully prepared, you know, for the technological, you know, side. And another thing is probably, uh, how different it is, um, practicing your tunes in your practice studio and then rehearsing them with in ears click and most times you can't hear the guitars as well so i had to learn the the tunes to such a degree it's actually easy to play along with cds because you really only when you're put in this situation do you realize it's easy to play along when everything is there and you'll you'll actually you'll gain cues from little like uh production effects it might just be like some swell is happening and then you're like like subconsciously you don't uh, subconsciously you clock that and you're like I, I every time you hit that course but then all of a sudden you've got a year's on and all you hear is click and you can barely hear the guitars suddenly you don't know the arrangement so well you know suddenly you don't hit that chorus every time um i think that was probably the most like whoa experience any train wrecks on stage when you were learning it that way uh, Le learning those hard lessons yeah yeah <laughs> it it's happened so you're mortal yeah, oh yeah <laughs> I'm human. Yeah. And it's tough, you know, when you're not fully comfortable, you know, fully in your comfort zone and you, and you don't have your hearing's not right. It's an incredible challenge to, to play on stage when your, your hearing is all jacked up, you know, but you know, I, there's cats that just play to click, you know, I, I can do that. You know, I always get the tunes up to that level, but I really don't prefer to do that. It's hard to feel the music. It's hard to to be musical because you're not surrounded by music. You're surrounded by a click. You're you saying know, all, there's guys <laughs> that all they do is play with a click and they don't have any of the band in their ears? Yeah. How is that enjoyable? Or there's guys that, or there's guys that just play to the album. I've seen that happen. Yeah, I know. I, I've yeah, but I've seen that's that. you're not playing to your band, right? That's, no, I, I'm not that's saying it's like right. playing yeah. to a click. 
Yeah. You know, except uh, then you have the music. The music is there. You know, it's right. not just dry click. Who do you high five after that's done? Like after the gig is no over? No one. Because do you, you high don't five know your anyone's eye- performance. And, 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 and cats would be like, oh, I totally screwed up. The, I total-. And you're just like, oh, you did? Yeah, I didn't notice. Well, that's what I mean. If you come off of it, it was a great gig for you. What do you do? High five your phone? You know, where the MP3s were? Like, dude, that was awesome. You played great tonight. <laughs> it's so strange. Hmm. Uh, yeah. That's interesting. I don't so, want to say names, but I do. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, we'll keep the names out. Um, but um, but that's what's really cool about, you know, the stuff with Eldar and Henrik as the gem project is that it's, you know, we're really playing together. We're listening to each other, you know, and we're, we're, we're melding, you know, we're, we're operating at such a high level where we can where we're all click proficient we can all stay to the click not get away from the click and then on top of that like synchronize with each other like in tune with each other you know and and play the parts navigate through all the the complex arrangement and be able to improvise too and play off of each other and and react and hear like be that's a that's a really high level that's you know that's what i like about the gary novak uh recording is that it's it's like all um interaction you know highest level yeah that's great um so moving on here a little bit um i've got a couple more questions for you and from the many conversations we've had, I feel like you have you've got this really good knowledge of where drumming came from, where it's going. You know a lot about drummers. Um, I read in that MD article you did. I think it was your most recent cover story with them. When you were asked about Weckel and Vinny and Gad, you referred to them as quote the old guys unquote, but. I don't want this to be taken out of context by our listeners because Mm -hmm. that was just a way that you classified them in relation to the question you were asked about current drummers. It wasn't any sign of disrespect. I mean, you definitely had the respect. You just were trying to place them in a timeline. Yeah. So my question for you is, who are the drummers from, two? like, say, let's go the year 2000, the year 2000 on that people will look back and refer to as having been groundbreaking? And I'm going to go ahead and justifiably place you in that category so that you... Don't get left out, so you don't have to play the humility card. Like, and I genuinely think that not because we're doing this podcast. Mm-hmm. Like, you're one of those guys that now people people put you in that group. People put, uh, I, I feel like at least for say metal drumming, people put Thomas from Meshuggah in that group. Yeah. Um, Benny grabs one of those guys where yeah. he just gets referred to that way. Mm-hmm. So for you, who would those groundbreaking guys be? Sort of in this generation of drummers, um, Mark Juliana. Definitely. Chris Dave. Yeah. Um, Ronald Bruner. Um, Thomas Pridgen. Um, Gavin Harrison. Although he's probably been at it since before 2000. Actually, uh, I, don't, I don't know the exact timeline. Sure. But, you know, I think I just became hip to him and like it was like four years ago or something porcupine you know? tree drumming uh, was it that stuff no it was actually when he played modern drummer that i saw him dude that's one like, of the cleanest drum sounds i've ever heard yeah it's incredible <laughs> it, was, it was crazy I, I was i was like oh my god that drum sound incredible yeah yeah, yeah. Hmm. that's pro- that probably plays a huge role you know um yeah daphne's prieto um and I throw this question out there because for anybody that's not lis- that's listening and maybe doesn't know any or hasn't heard some of these names, a lot of them I'm sure they've heard, but maybe there's a guy they haven't heard, and by hearing you name check them, no, that's a good I'm thing. trying. To, I've I've kind of hit the big guys in my opinion. Yeah, but sure. Now I guess I'll I'll try to um, think of guys that are less known, you know. But doing just as cool stuff. Yeah, or have have done like here's the thing is like you, it can't just be um, 
It, your qualification was that they have to change things, that they've had an influence, that they've changed. Because you, we were, you were talking in that article about Weckl, Vinny, Gad, those three names. I mean, they're so huge that like I don't even know Vinny. But I don't call him Mr. Calyuta. I don't call him Vinny Calyuta. But I call him Vinny because that's how right. like he's known. Yeah. Which is always funny to me. I just refer to him that way. Or, or Gad. Everyone says Gad. They don't just say Steve. If you just called him Steve, dude, what about Steve? People are like, Steve who? <laughs> you know? Yeah, because there's Steve Jordan. There's there's quite a few. He's got the Steves, iconic but... name kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Um... But if you want to throw in some guys who are maybe less known but still doing equally important work, please. Yeah. <sighs> Uh, I, I have to keep a list in my phone, man. I, uh, uh, Gergo Borlai. Uh, that fool is incredibly clean. It's ridiculous. Like, and... Um, yeah. Incredible vocabulary, too. And, you know, I've, I've seen him play at a level of, um, you know perfection that you know you can i can only aspire to hit you know i'm i'm not the cleanest guy you know i have i have my moments but i've seen gergo you know do like a 15 20 minute solo without a single mistake wow without a single little oh, what was that it was completely like wow yeah impeccable timing mm. Um, and I've seen him do that. Uh, that was at the Warsaw Drum Festival in uh, Poland. And then I um, saw him at the Big Potato in L.A. playing with Scott Kinsey. And it was like another time where I was like, everything was perfect. And I was mm -hmm. like, this motherfucker, god damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Just when I think I'm getting good. <laughs> so before I ask you your last question... Anybody else you think of, or you want to come back to that some I mean, other time? Moritz Mueller is, is got some cool metric modulation shit going on, and I I love I love that stuff. I'm all about that. Okay, this leads me to my final question. This is it. And I know you say you're not the guy for basics to teach the basics that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Are you going to ask me a basic question, anyways? I am. <laughs> But I'm going to frame it around something that's not necessarily a basic uh, concept. So you just mentioned Moritz and metric modulation. And yeah. in a lot of write-ups about you, that term gets thrown around a lot. People refer to you and they refer to metric mod modulation. So uh, for a lot of folks who wouldn't be too clear on what exactly that is, can you explain in its... I know it's not a basic concept, but if mm -hmm. you had to break it down and simplify Very simply. it. Yeah, please. What is that? Well, metric means meter. Modulation is um, modulating to another place. It's modulating to another meter. Um, and when you say modulating to another meter, you mean uh, morphing what you're playing into to feeling into another meter or time? What, explain that when you say yeah, modulating. So, you know, you're not just modulating to a random other meter it's by way of some rate so the most typical metric modulation is through the triplet as you take the triplet rate so you have a quarter note and you take that triplet rate and you act as if that's 16th notes that's the most basic form of metric modulation but you can do it in a variety of ways you can you can do it to the you can metrically modulate to the quintuplet you can um you can treat the dotted eighth as a which is you know an eighth note if it's dotted it means add a half of that value which is a 16th note so three 16th notes is your value then if you treat that as a triplet then you modulate to the dotted eighth note. You can also modulate to the quintuplet rate, too. You can modulate to the septuplet rate. Um, you could even modulate to, like, you know, you know how we just took the dotted eighth at three sixteenth notes? You modulate to, to the acting as if, 
you know, every three sixteenth notes is a quarter note pulse. You'd even do that with five. You could say for every five sixteenth notes, um, I want a quarter note and I'm going to modulate to that tempo. So it's, it's mathematical. It can get complex, you know, um, and, uh, I'm I'm exploring quite a few different ways of metrically modulating that are not so mathematically dry that are that are more uh, musically applicable. Mm. One way is is through accents, um, having accents in a meter and um, changing those like basically, uh, yeah, basically changing those to uh, the nearest quintuplet maybe and. Um, then you know doing it that way uh the 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 nearest quintuplet to those accents wherever those accents are like you can you we do that all the time with straight eighths like we'll say okay the rhythm is da 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 and then it's like well let's let's change those accents to the nearest triplets you know that's just swinging it da 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 all that's happening is that that eighth that was directly in the middle when it was straight gets knocked over to the third partial of the triplet. It gets kind of slotted in that same place every time. So you can do the same thing instead of going two notes, which are eighth note, two, two notes per quarter note. You can go to instead of two to three, um, you can go like four to five. It's so interesting because while you said it's very mathematical, listening to you explain it, it sounds like its sole purpose is to adjust and express a feel. Yeah, it's a feel change, yeah. But you have to almost, before you can, you haven't to learn to walk, you know, or crawl before you can walk, it's almost like you have to apply the math to get it so that you can then yeah. forget the math and then feel it. Yeah, yeah. There's one, one, one more really, like, uh, th this... Is a better example, um, and this is actually something that I learned from the Efron Toro DVD from Drum Channel. Um, he he goes into some really cool stuff about frequency on there. But one of one of the like how all tones relate to color and light, and it's mi mind blowing. But anyways, um, one example he goes through, which is kind of what started me on this like whole process, um, is. Be, the relationship between five and seven and it's when you're playing a five that's like one two three one two three one two one two one two three one two three one two one two so you're not just simply in five it's an accent pattern in five so that's an accent pattern i was talking about um if you if you look at um the concurrent like uh like a five measure over a seven measure meaning the length of time a five measure happens is the same a seven measure happens then uh the accent pattern for a typical seven which is that lines up almost perfectly with the five so like you get to so one sounds like five one one is five one is seven you know um but just kind of like straddling between these two is pretty interesting like i actually in my head i'm still in five but i'm going you know so it's like magic that's what i like about it is metric modulation can be like magic and it and it should be it should feel like it shouldn't feel like uh you know how um uh, singers like will they'll modulate up a half step, mm -hmm. and they and they keep modulating up a half step. It's a real di it, that's called a direct modulation, and it's very like in your face. Bam, there it is. We're up now. We're up a half step, and now we're up another half step. It's like you know, there's nothing that's artful about that except for that. It's like 
I don't know. Not not nothing artful, but it's it's just not as like crafted, you know. Um, and it's more uh, direct to the listener. It's more, you know. Um, it's a very obvious. Oh, okay, we've moved up from yes. here. Right. So I like, you know, the the harmonic modulating to another key where I don't even realize it's modulated to another key. I'm just like, wow, this is like a different place. It's like the, you know, I'm hearing the same things like maybe the same melody or this same um like some of this same feel of chords but i know it's different it's like it's a different a, a new dimension so mm -hmm. that's what i like about this metric modulation stuff done in this way is that it can you know really i don't know bring you into another dimension but and like through through a musical way because you people hear accents you know mm -hmm. they hear like they hear this so if you can that's what their ear is caught on to then you can exploit that take advantage of that and you know force you know Instead of one two three one two three one two one two three one two three force one two three four one two three four one two three and you've modulated to an eleven, you can force five five four five, and modulate to the seven. It's like if you can keep magic. their heads bobbing and their feet tapping to the original feel. Yeah, eventually they'll around. get lost because uh, you know. Well, that's the thing. Like you know, it'll be it'll be subtle. It won't just be like oh all, all of a sudden it'll be like they'll kind of be. Like oh, I can still tap my foot, but so something's happening. Yeah. What's uh, the notes in between have changed or something? What, and then they'll start to slowly realize, oh, we're in a we're in a different place. You know, hmm. it's not like waking up like oh, I'm I'm in a totally different place all of right. a sudden. You know, it's it's gradual. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Matt, thank you so much for joining us for the podcast. Okay. This is super cool, enlightening stuff. I think that uh, everybody listening will get a lot out of this. I hope so. Yeah, absolutely. At least man. the mo metric modulation bit. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Matt. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to Minel Radio. If you liked this episode, please head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. We would appreciate it very much. Thanks, and we'll see you soon.